All right, thank you, James. Thank you, Wanda, for playing for us today. It's good to have you back, James. How cold is it in Wisconsin? <laughs> 14 with snow. Well, it's definitely warmer here uh, than it is there. So we thank you for your, your ministry. All right, turn with me to 2 Corinthians chapter number 10. We're in the midst of a sermon series. And when you get to 2 Corinthians chapter number 10, uh, flip all, also over to Philippians chapter 4. If I said that wrong, I do apologize. So 2 Corinthians chapter number 10, and then have a finger in Philippians chapter number 4. Going through a sermon series on what we should be thinking about. Yeah, it's an interesting, uh, uh, interesting thought that we have of, okay, we can control our thoughts, but do we do so? And so the Bible is very clear about what we ought to be thinking about, and so let us take heed. So 2 Corinthians chapter number 10, we're going to begin in verse number 4 and go through verse number 6. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God, and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ, and having in a readiness to revenge all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled. Philippians chapter 4 now. We're going to be looking at verse number 8. Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue, if there be any praise, think on these things. Let's pray and ask the Lord's blessing on our time together. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your goodness and your grace that you have allowed us here today. Father, we look forward to hearing from your word today. Help us to have our minds set on things above, not things below. Help our minds be ready in all eagerness, to know what we think, to be ready to say no to some thoughts, yes to others. Father, we ask You to help us today. Minister to our hearts. Show areas in our life that we need to get right with You. Show areas in our life that You want to encourage us to keep to be faithful for You. And Father, may You be given all the glory, honor, and praise. I do pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So for those who haven't uh, been with us uh, in our sermon series, we've been going through uh, Proverbs, nah, get the right book, Philippians, <laughs> They're all, they all begin with P, right? Uh, Psalms, Proverbs, and Philippians, yes. Philippians chapter number 4, verse number 8, and we, we've been talking about the very fact that because we are in Christ, we need to control our thoughts. And I love what 2 Corinthians talks about is our warfare is not carnal, but yet it's spiritual through the pulling down of strongholds that we cast away thoughts and we take hold of others. And we, we put into captivity those thoughts and we say, okay, should I be thinking on this thought that has just entered my mind or should I cast it away? And a lot of times I find in my own life that there's a lot of thoughts that come my way and I say, I have to take a step back and say, hmm, is this thought right? And how do we de uh, decipher for ourselves what is right and what is wrong? We talked about that in the beginning part of our sermon series, Whatsoever Things Are True. And we went into a good understanding about what is truth and, and objective truth versus subjective truth. And we have to come to the conclusion that God's Word is the truth. It is what we have to base our thoughts on. It's what we have to compare and contrast what we think about on a regular basis with what the Word of God actually says. 
And so thinking about what is true, we went on to think about things which, what, that which is uh, honest or honorable. And then we went from there to thinking on that which is just, that which is justful or justice, uh, which God alone is truly altogether all, all just. And we talked about that for our time with communion. And last week we talked about whatsoever things are pure. And we talked about clean thoughts. And, and any, any question about, oh, I really would like to hear that sermon again, definitely go to our, our uh, YouTube channel. The uh, information's on the back of our bulletin. Uh, go to that YouTube channel and uh, latest stuff will be there. And definitely type in Chapel Baptist Church in Claremont to get the exact channel. Uh, so today we're talking about whatsoever things are, and the next one is lovely. Whatsoever things are lovely. Now, it's interesting to think about. It says, you know, I've heard the, the cliche expression of beauty is in the eye of the beholder. Yeah, so everybody thinks something is pretty when other people might disagree with that. And so we, we see a... Uh, a thought about, well, what is, what is beauty? What is pretty? And uh, we look at different things of creation and we say, wow, that is amazing. Like if you have seen a sunrise from the beach, absolutely beautiful. All the rays of the sun coming up, wow, that is magnificent. Or if you go in the middle of nowhere and you look up at the sky, at the stars at nighttime, Wow, you say, wow, that is so amazing. Now, in, in our cities, you know, we can't see as much, but yet we know it's there. So what is lovely? What is lovely to you? Might be different from what is lovely to somebody else. Like, for instance, if, some, if you talk to a guy, that guy might say, what is lovely? Oh, the Lamborghini. <laughs> that's a really nice sports car you ask a a lady they might say well this you know butterflies and and various things like that although i do like looking at butterflies they're amazing god's creation uh but in all reality if we're talking about what is beautiful what is lovely to you then we're going to say well whatsoever things are lovely that's kind of wishy-washy if you say well well, what is beautiful to me or lovely to me is not lovely to you. There has to be a concrete versus that which is subjective. In the Bible, it, this word lovely is a very interesting word. The word itself is very closely associated with that of brotherly love. Uh, for those who understand the original language, uh, uh, philos or phileo is that of love like a brother. Love with a relationship. It's where, you know, see the, the word Philadelphia, city of brotherly love, is what it's called specifically in the Greek. So in this word itself, it's that which is lovely conditionally. It's lovely, it's basically whatever is fond of, whatever is that of effectual love for, is this word of lovely so the question that I asked when I was studying this week, what does the Bible say? What is biblically lovely? What is biblically lovely? And of course, the thing that I'm going to be talking about is everything to do about God. Everything to do about God. You think, it's an amazing thing. If you go to the Bible and say, okay, this is a book about me, which you're not technically wrong. Uh, this does have everything that we need for life and godliness. But if we go to the book as, uh, Bible as kind of a self-help book, we're missing the forest for the trees. What we have here in our book is God's specific revelation to each and every one of us. God reveals himself in one way, to that of nature itself, through creation. We can see the handiwork of God, and, and we can make some conclusions about God for what we see in the universe. But yet, that's a little bart about what God reveals through His inspired, special Word to us. And so we're going to be going through the Bible and talking about God. But we're going to be very specific about it. 
So what is lovely? Everything to do with God is lovely. So first of all, we're going to see God's particulars. God's particulars. And um, if you're taking notes, everything will have to do with God's, and then the first letter is a P. <laughs> God's particulars, and we're going to go through a list of these. What I mean by God's particulars is specifically who God is and what He does. Who God is and what He does. If you don't get your understanding about God from the Scriptures itself, then you are wasting your time and finding out who God really is. This is the only place you really, really find out who the God of the whole universe really is. And we see different uh, descriptions about God throughout the Bible. And one amazing description of Him is in Exodus chapter 34. This amazing Scripture tells us who God is based on who He says He is. Moses, give you a context about this, Moses he asked for to see the glory of God. And true enough, Moses has seen uh, the image that he's speaking to, that of God himself. It's an amazing thing to think about. If you could ask God any question, what would it be? Moses had that opportunity of one face-to-face -face kind of with God, as much as a human being could have. He had seen him with the burning bush, and, and God has been with them all the way from the, the from that of Egypt all the way to where they're currently at on Mount Sinai. Now, true enough, the people had some problems. In chapter 32, we have the entire nation of Israel saying, hmm, well, we don't know what happened to Moses. It's been 40 days. It's been a long time. So let's go ahead and make our own gods, and that will lead us. Really? You're going to make yourself some gods that you just created and have that lead you. And of course, Aaron being uh, very wanting to please the crowd, he decided to get all the gold, and then he fashioned himself a calf. Behold, this is your God. No. God was angry with them, of course, and they, he actually wanted to destroy them. Moses talked him out of it, which is a very fascinating study to think about. Moses talking with God. Anyway, after God says that He's not going to destroy the nation of Israel. He then is alone with Moses. Moses then requests, show me thy glory. Show me your glory. And the Lord says to him that you can't see everything because you'll die. But I'll show you a little bit about what you could look at. And so He placed him in the cleft of the rock, put His hand over Moses, and then when God's glory shone, he saw his afterglow. The little bit of trailing that, if you turn on the light and turn it off real fast, you'll see this little bit of light that's still there. That's what God showed Moses. And it was enough for him to be a human nightlight. He went off the, the mountain and, and he shone and somebody basically, ah, we can't, we can't talk with you because you're so bright. So that he had to put a veil on his face. Amazing, just a little bit of God makes you Huh, makes you glow. <laughs> Amen. Uh, we think about it, but yet God showing His glory, that was an amazing experience for Moses. But what fascinates me about the text is not the glory itself, but rather what God says is His glory. It's who He is. So notice with me in, uh, in Exodus chapter 34, it says, And the Lord passed by him, that's Moses, uh, and proclaimed, the Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abundant in goodness and truth, keeping His mercy for thousands, forgiven iniquity and transgression and sin, and that by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the Father upon the children's and upon the children's children unto the third and to the fourth generation. Who is God? And he describes himself in this way. The first part you see is the Lord. That's L-O-R-D, all caps. For those who don't know, in the King James Bible, we have Lord, all caps. And sometimes we have Lord, capital L, lowercase O-R-D. And as well as uh, lowercase L-O-R-D. Each one of these kind of represents a different word in the original Hebrew. 
when it's L-O-R-D capitalized, that is for the name of God. Some say Jehovah, some say Yahweh, some say Yahweh, you know, different variations of this name. We actually don't know how to pronounce it because it was called the ineffable Tetragrammaton. I know, that sounds very fascinating. What it means? The unspoken four letters. That's all it means. The ineffable Tetragrammaton. Unspoken four letters. Because it's four letters in the Hebrew uh, uh, Bible. And we don't know how to say it because they reverenced it so much that they would actually say Hashem, which is the name, or Adonai, which is the lowercase, uh, Lord. And so, we don't even know, but we know and understand where this word comes from. It's the Hebrew word for being. Meaning, God is, God was, God will ever be. There is no uh, shadow, there is no turning for Him that He cannot be. You know, it's a very fascinating thing I was, I was seeing when I was a kid. A certain show, and it had a lot of different like gods or whatever, and one funny thing about it is that, oh, people f- stop believing in me, so I'm fading away. That happened throughout the, the show. I'm like, wow, that's pretty pathetic. <laughs> if you're really a god, it doesn't matter who you believe, or who believes in you, you still are God. And so God alone is, He is, He was, He will ever be. He cannot die. He cannot cease to exist. He will always be. And so, praise the Lord for that. We don't have to worry about, oh, I, I hope God's still here. Uh, we don't have to worry about, oh, I hope God's still with me. Oh, I hope God still knows what I'm going through. Absolutely, He does. He will always be God. No matter what man may say, He is still God. I don't care if Nietzsche said God is dead. Oh, what? Who are you to say that? Because God is absolutely and ever will be. And so he is, and he will never ever change. He says that he's the Lord God. It's an uh, addition with this word God, which has the understanding of that of power. You look at all creation, and it had to come from somewhere, right? The entire universe had to come from somewhere. You know, some scientists would say, well, Big Bang. Well, where did that come from? Uh, you have uh, all these different gases, all these different molecules, different uh, electrons, neutrons, and uh, protons, and you, you have all this matter. It had to come from somewhere, and guess what? That is God. God spoke in the beginning. God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and, and, and formless and void, but yet God spoke it into existence. He just spoke the stars out there. It's an amazing thing to think about. Billions and millions of solar systems that are yet to be explored, and He knows them all by name. God, He is the Lord God. He is merciful. He is gracious. Uh, Interesting thing about mercy, a marvelous thing to think about is His mercy. What is mercy? It is God withholding from us that which we do deserve. You might say, well, God withholds from me something I deserve? Yeah, it's not a good thing. It's not a good thing of the things that you deserve. Each and every one of us, we deserve God's wrath because of our sin. God is absolutely holy. God is absolutely righteous. And He cannot have unrighteousness prevail. He has to deal with justice. He has to uphold perfect justice Ultimate justice will come from God one way or another. One way that He has supplied for every single person on the face of the planet is through His own Son, Jesus Christ. He sent the Lord into the world that was made by Him. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Everything was made by Him. He created everything. He came into the world and experienced life as you and I do, except for He was without sin. He lived the perfect life, the life that we should have lived but never could. And He died the sacrificial death on the cross for every single person in this room, every single person in the neighborhood over there, everybody in the neighborhood over here, over here, in the next state, uh, in every state, every country, every continent. He did it all for every single person who is living here on the planet Earth and whoever was 
here before us. He did it all. He was merciful. He took the wrath of God on Himself and gave to us grace. What grace is, is God giving us that which we do not deserve. We do not deserve forgiveness of sins. We do not deserve His righteousness, but He has given it to us in Christ. What He gave us in His grace is so much more. And we can go on and on about it. He's long-suffering. That means He's patient. Oh, if He wasn't so patient with the human race, there wouldn't be anybody still alive. (laughs) You think about all the heartache and the headache that the human race gave God when He created them and they fell into sin. From that point on, you have sinful man rejecting God, sinful man cursing God, sinful man replacing God with something that's totally made up, totally there and is part of God's creation possibly. And over and over and over again, uh, one Christian comedian said that uh, uh, God made for us teenagers so that uh, there will be someone that we can understand of, okay, we reject their yeah, even appearance of being a real, you know, that type of thing. I don't I totally bet, mess that up. But think about this. We reject Him, but God withholds His judgment against us. Amazing. He is long-suffering towards us. You see that with the nation of Israel specifically, because as many times as they mess up, and that's the whole Old Testament, yet God only gives them judgment after so often. We can see this over and over again. Abundant in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity, and by no means clear the guilty. He is justful. So we have gone in His particulars. We could talk... Talk about this forever because God is so infinite. He is so amazing. Um, I see the time. We've got to move on. So God's particulars. He is absolutely lovely because He is the one that we should have affectionate for. He is the one that we should be fond of no matter who or what we are or who we are. We have to be affectionate towards God because that is the right thing for us to do. I love it what, uh, what Augustine or Augustine said, uh, one of the early church fathers in one of his books. He wrote and he said that the, only, the restlessness of man will only be complete when we find our rest in God. He is the one that satisfies us. He is the one that we need to have affection for. He is the one that we should worship. He is the one that we should praise. And so he... It is absolutely and utterly lovely. Also that of God's people. Now true enough, there are a lot of things about God's people that, well, we could just be honest, it's unlovely. <laughs> Any times that we're more like the world than we are like Christ, then we're kind of unlovely. But yet, God has given us each other. That's an amazing thing. A lot of times, you know, people say, well, I can stay home and I can do church at home and, and I, I, could, I could do that. <clears throat> well, one thing about it though is you kind of miss the point of church. It's not just worshiping God, but it's good to worship God. It's not just reading the Bible and hearing the Bible explained. That's great too. But what church is, is a body of believers coming together to build each other up to be more like Christ. And you can't do that from a television screen, to be quite honest. And I'm not speaking any, against anybody that has, has to be, like maybe perhaps they're, they're uh, at their home and they have to do it that way because they can't leave their house. I don't know. I'm not speaking against anything about that, but here's the thing about it. Church is important. Our camaraderie together is important to help us to strive to be more like Christ as we see in each other more and more things that are connected with that of Christ and what Christ would do and what Christ would say and His attitude towards other people. The more and more we see that in each one of us, the more help that we are together. And we see Apostle Paul. I love the Apostle Paul. He's like the number one Christian that I could think of, though he says he's not perfect. Praise the Lord that... (laughs) Such a great man like the Apostle Paul says, I'm not perfect. I've not attained. Praise the Lord. Uh, Because I'm not there either. So uh, definitely not. 
Uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse number 7 through 8. But we were gentle among you, even as a nurse cherisheth her children. So being affectionately desirous of you, we were willing to have imparted unto you not the gospel of God only, but also our own souls, because ye were dear unto us. This word dear is the same word that we find as lovely. You were dear. You were lovely to us. God's people. In Philippians chapter 4, verse number 1, right before our text here, uh, Therefore, my brethren, dearly beloved and longed for, my joy and crown, so stand fast in the Lord, my dearly beloved. What a wonderful amount of things that he says about the church of Philippi. He loves the church of Philippi. For those who don't know, the, the, the letter to the Philippians is a thank you letter for, for the Philippians from Paul because he received of the Philippians uh, money that he, they gave of their own necessity to help Paul in the manner that he needed help. And so he's, this is his thank you letter. So he says of these Philippian believers, they are brethren dearly beloved, longed for, that means I can't wait to be with you again, my joy, my crown, my dearly beloved. He was definitely affection for God's people. So we need to be affectionate. We need to find ourselves saying that we are fond of God's people. Not only that, but also God's plan. I love Ephesians chapter number 1. It says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in the heavenly places. He then goes into description about what the Father did, what the Son did, what the Spirit does. I love it. It's wonderful. God's plan for salvation. It says, According as He hath chosen us in Him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before Him in love, having predestinated unto us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to Himself, according to the good pleasure of His will, to the praise of the glory of His grace, wherein He hath made us accepted in the beloved. You might say, wow, that's a lot of uh, big words there. Okay, predestinated, and uh, uh, He has chosen us in Him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy. <laughs> we often lose our place there. Here's what God the Father did. He planned salvation. He planned that there is a way for the human race to get it right with Him. He chose the specific person, Jesus Christ, to come into the world to be made sin for us who knew no sin so that we might be having the righteousness of God in Him. This is what God the Father did. He planned it all. But not only that, we see the Son. We see in whom we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of His grace, wherein He hath, made us, hath abounded toward us in all wisdom and, and prudence, having made known unto us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure which he hath pur purposed in himself, that in the dispensation of the fullness of times he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, even in him in whom also we have obtained an inheritance and being predestinated according to the purpose of him who worketh all things after the counsel of his own will, that we should be to the praise of His glory who first trusted in Christ. What does that all say? Well, Jesus Christ came and died in our place. Without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. There had to be a sacrifice. That's why you have all the sacrifices of the Old Testament. Now, I don't know about you, but the sacrifice of the Old Testament is, is quite bloody. If we actually did it right here, right now, in the sanctuary, I'd take in a, a, a lamb, and I'd do exactly what the Bible says to do, we'll have a mess. <laughs> we will have a mess and, and catch fire on this, this, this animal sacrifice, but it was all for a picture. It was there for a picture to show who the Messiah would be, that of Jesus Christ, He would die in our behalf, the one sin sacrifice over all. That's why He gave us the atonement. He gave us salvation through His blood. Oh, how great He is in that He has given us all that of wisdom and that of truth and that of knowledge. 
and that He has predestinated us according to the purpose of Him that worketh all things after the counsel of His will, that we should be the praise of God. Huh. Wow! Here's what we have. We right now who believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, we are in a process called sanctification. That's a big word that means we are becoming more like Jesus. Each and every day we have purpose because we have the good works which He has made us as His workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works. That every single day there is purpose. Every single day God wants us to do whatever He wants us to do and we just look to Him to, to have our day to plan it out for us. We look to Him to see what He wants us to do, not what we have planned necessarily for the day. It's amazing when those two things line up, when God's plan and God, our plan are the same. But yeah, it's an amazing thing to think about the salvation in Christ. And it says in verse number 13, In whom we, ye also trusted after that ye heard the word of the truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that ye believed, ye were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance unto the redemption of the purchased possession unto the praise of His glory. We have the Holy Spirit and He sealed us. He labeled us as His own. He labeled us as God's. Now we are God's, we are not ourselves. We are His possession, not ourselves. It's not my will be done, but now His will be done because we are bought with the price, the precious blood, of the Lord Jesus Christ, and so we therefore need to glorify our bodies and our spirits, which are God's. So with that, we have God's perfect plan. We need to be seeing ourselves as affectionate towards that, being fond of God's plan, but also God's presence. Psalm 84, verses 1 through 3. How amiable are thy tabernacles, O Lord of hosts! My soul longeth, yea, even fainteth for the courts of the Lord. That's pretty interesting right there. David is, it, actually it's not even David that wrote this uh, psalm, it's the sons of Korah. Amazing thing to think about. The sons of Korah, for those who don't know who they are, their father, Korah, was a uh, mischievous person. He rebelled against God and wanted to become a great one besides Moses. And so what happened was, okay, okay, Moses, tell everybody to get away from Korah and away from those who have followed him. If Korah has done right, then he will die just like a normal person. But if he has rebelled against God, here's what we're going to do. Something new that has never been done before. The earth will open up and swallow him whole. And lo and behold, the earth opened up, and everybody that was uh, connected with Korah and those who were with him went down this big hole, and it closed right up. Well, that was different. Now, the sons of Korah, it's interesting, all of his family didn't go with him because they knew that he did wrong and they distanced themselves from Korah. Now we have the sons of Korah writing this wonderful hymn that my soul longeth, yea, even fainteth for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh crieth out for the living God. Yea, the sparrow hath found a house and the swallow a nest for herself where she may lay her young, even thine altars, O Lord of hosts, my King and my God. In Psalm 50, 95, verse number 2, it says, Let us come before His presence with thanksgiving and make a joyful noise unto Him with psalms. In Psalm 16, verse number 11, Thou wilt show me the path of life. In thy presence is fullness of joy. At thy right hand there are pleasures forevermore. And we could talk about God's presence. God's presence in His house. God's presence also with us. Psalm 139 says, Whither shall I go from Thy Spirit? Or whither shall I flee from Thy presence? If I send up into heaven, Thou art there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, Thou art there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the inner, uttermost parts of the sea, even there shall Thy hand lead me and Thy right hand shall hold me. God's presence. Are we fond of God's presence? Are we affectionate towards God's presence? Last but not least, God's praise. 
you know, we could go through the entire book of the book of Psalms. Now, that, if you want to equate it as the longest book of the Bible, you could. Many people do. Um, it's the song book of Israel. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. There's actually one, uh, one psalm that kind of just shows a good summary of what the book of Psalms is about. It's the last, uh, last psalm. Praise ye the Lord. Praise God in His sanctuary. Praise Him in the firmament of His power. Praise Him for His mighty acts. Praise Him according to His excellent goodness. Praise Him with the sound of the trumpet. Praise Him with the psalmstry and harp. Praise Him with the uh, timbrel and dance. Praise Him with the stringed instruments and organs. Praise Him upon the loud cymbals. Praise Him upon the high-sounding cymbals. Let everything that hath pra- br- breath praise the Lord. Praise ye the Lord. Pretty much sums it up. Book of Psalms, right in one. Praise, 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 praise. Now, here's the thing about it. Here's what's very important about this message. Is the question, (laughs) do we find God lovely? And you don't answer out loud, do you find God lovely? There are a lot of things that we have in the world that uh, kind of substitutes for joy in God. There's a lot of things that we could be thinking about throughout the day. You know, some think about work and, all right, what's the next thing I have to do? What's the next thing that I have to uh, talk to? What's, what's, what's the plan that I have to go through? How can I make my employer happy? And I've been there, you know, working at the hospital. That was... That was interesting training for the pastor. <laughs> but yet, think about it. What do we think about most often in the day? Those who are retired? Well, you're not thinking about work. I guess you're thinking about what you're going to just do the day. I don't know. What do you think about? I don't know, because I'm not retired. <laughs> I wouldn't know what a retired person thinks about. Um, but yet, you know, some people might think about their hobbies. Some people might think about Uh, the sporting events that they're looking forward to. Nothing wrong with those. But if it replaces God in our thoughts, in our affections, that's a problem. That's called idolatry. God deserves our utmost praise, our utmost affection, our utmost trust, our utmost love and affection. But yet, do we love Him? I'm sure there's possibly some areas in in each one of our lives that we could talk about as, oh, I have a struggle with this, or thinking about this too much, or thinking about uh, elections, thinking about that of politics, thinking about of the news. If you ever want to feel depressed, just turn on the news got plenty of things to be depressed about. But think about it. We could be thinking about so much more. God Himself and the fullness of His glory that one day we will see if we're in Christ. There's nothing more greater that you could ever think about than God Himself and His Word and all that He's doing in the world. You know, after every election, I love to remind myself, you know what? No matter which way this goes, God's still king. <laughs> no matter what happens, God is still supreme. No matter what, what happens, God is still sovereign. And if it has happened, okay. He has allowed it to happen. Okay. God has a bigger plan than my, my little, okay, four or two or six years of dealing with somebody in, in politics or as a state. Or, you know, we, we should you know, always vote for those who are biblically in line. But when elections don't turn out what you would say the right way, praise the Lord anyway. Because God has so, so much of a bigger picture than what we could ever understand. And sure enough, if it doesn't go the way that we think, there could be a couple things that might be happening. One, God is getting ready for a real revival in our country. Because it's not when the good times happen, it's when the bad times roll. 
that the church of God does its work best because now you have the light in the midst of the darkness. You have people turning to God in the difficult days rather than in blessing. And so that could be what's happening. Or it could be, well, the end. The rapture will happen at some point in time in the future. And I'm ho- I was hoping that it would be like right now, but because uh, <laughs> it will be so much better to be in heaven than to be down here on the earth. But because we're here, we have to make a difference. But we can only make a difference if God is our true affection in life. Well, one thing I haven't talked about specifically directly is that of salvation itself. If you have never received Christ as your own personal Savior, do so today. The wages of sin is death. We see that culmination of that as the second death, the lake of fire. It says in Revelation chapter 20, the most heart-rending chapter of the Bible. For us Christians, if we read that and we don't cry a little bit, there's something wrong. <laughs> To see and understand people are going to one of two places. And most people are going to an eternal torment. A place of eternal fire to pay for their own sins when they don't have to. What God did was He sent His Son into this world to become sin for us so that we can become a child of God. But it's only through Christ. If there's somebody here that has never received Christ as their own personal Savior, do so today. We're going to have a moment, a time to pray. Yes, as what God has been dealing with us, I'll invite Wanda to come to the organ. She's going to play through a hymn a couple of times, and we're, we're going to have time for us to pray. And then pray silently to the Lord. I'll start us off, and I'll finish this up. And in the midst of that, it is your turn to pray. Let's go ahead and pray. Father, we thank you so much for this day you've given us. We thank you for giving us your word. How great and how amazing you are. You deserve all of our praise, all of the honor, all of the glory that we could give to any other person. We need to give it to you. Father, whatever our thoughts might be, Father, may you help us to consecrate ourselves to you. If somebody's here that's not received Christ as their own personal Savior, may they do so right now. I do pray.